here. Hopefully everybody can see that all right. Looks good. Okay. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, as Leah said, my name is Kelly Skinner. Um, I grew up on Robinson Superior Treaty Territory and I currently live and work on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, as she mentioned, I am an associate professor in the School of Public Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo and I hold an applied public health chair. So the research and evaluation projects of our team are on topics of food security and northern food systems, and also include water security, climate change and environment, food policy and health and risk communication. And the methods that we use often include evaluation of community led programs, which I'm planning to describe in this presentation as case studies. We're starting off quickly with a poll. Um, and sometimes I use this poll actually with my students. Uh, Leah is going to be launching the poll, so you should be able to see it and be able to click on an answer. So the question is, have you ever had the opportunity to visit a Northern community in Canada? And I'm going to let you decide how you define Northern when you answer this question. Sorry, can you guys see the polls? I'm just having trouble seeing if I can. I can. You can, okay, great. Yes. Okay. And it's telling me that we're at 85% participation. It's slowing down a bit, but still a few people who are clicking. So maybe we'll wait till it. All right, 88%. Oh, 89% part people participated. Maybe we can stop the poll. So this is actually much different than I expected. Um, so we have a large group of people today here, 47% um, who have had the opportunity to visit a Northern community. I'm not sure how you chose to define that and 53% who have not. Um, I didn't use the word remote, notice that I use the word northern um, and when I ask this question of my students um, whether I'm guest lecturing or teaching a class I really have a pretty low response rate um, uh, to yes um, most of the students have not had the opportunity to visit a northern community so I'm really um, surprised actually by this group at, at having this but maybe it's the topic area and that's why you came to the webinar so um, so, uh, and maybe we can discuss that a little bit uh, at the end of the presentation. So thanks for doing the poll. So food systems are defined by place and local circumstances. Um, the Northern food system really looks different. So in addition to store-bought food and to a small extent agricultural activities, Northern food systems are based on harvesting country foods through hunting, fishing and gathering. And food sharing and reciprocity really plays an important role in this food system as do local informal food economies. Northern communities have been able to sustain their food systems and thrive for millennia because of their close connections and relationships with the land and water and their understanding of the environment. And they really are stewards of that environment and the animals that they eat. With food, this is an integrated system and food comes from that land, water and sky and the environment of food can impact the healthiness of that food and thus impact the health and well-being of the people who eat it. So there's multiple impacts on this Northern food system. Climate change, contaminants, and food prices are only a few factors that impact northern food security. Understanding climate impacts and adaptation potential in Canada's north is really critical, as the observed and projected temperatures in the north are greater than the rest of the country. And since food systems are really tightly linked to the health of the environment, the health of community members, and the long-term sustainability of communities. So as a result of these sort of aspects and other colonial impacts, the prevalence of household food insecurity in Northern Canada is much higher than the South. This is probably not new to you. For example, in the Northwest Territories, which I'm gonna be speaking about today, the rate of household food insecurity is about 25 to 30%. And that's about two to three times higher than the rest of Canada. 
And, you know, we really know that store-bought food in the North will always be expensive. It doesn't contribute to self-sufficiency nor broader food security constructs such as things like sustainable livelihoods and food sovereignty. And research to address these impacts really requires an interdisciplinary team of, of academics, regional and community partners, community researchers, government decision and policymakers. So uh, thankfully in 2019, our team was successful in securing a large multi-year team grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to work with six communities in four regions of the Northwest Territories. And this project evolved from many years of collaborative work and relationship building um, that our team had done. Our, our research questions really came from the communities. We did have um, an engagement event uh, before the full application went in where we had people from the Northwest Territories actually come to Waterloo, along with students and people from other universities, our colleagues, um, and to really develop that application together for this funding. Um, our main collaboration is funded by CIHR, but the smaller case study projects we're working on that I'm going to describe today have multiple funders. So the broad perspective of our research program really considers all aspects of the northern food system. The main aim is to learn from and enhance existing food security and climate adaptation initiatives, so things that people are already doing in the north, and then to share what has been learned to inform climate change and food security action at the local, regional, territorial, and national levels. Our northern partners during this engagement process also asked us to incorporate themes of traditional knowledge, governance, youth, and gender into the research that we're doing. So some of our main overarching questions are, what can we learn from Northern food systems? How can we support and facilitate stronger self-determined food systems? And how can we use this learning to help maintain our access to good food in the face of climate change? Each community has its own place-based and localized food system. And I know this from working for a long time. I originally worked a lot in uh, Northern Ontario in remote communities um, on food security initiatives and now have primarily been working in the Northwest Territories since 2015. And while we know that income policies such as things like basic income have been shown to reduce food insecurity, community init food initiatives have met with varying success. And these initiatives are often less successful when designed and led without community input or local knowledges. Food-based interventions that are grounded in community values and priorities are those that are most successful and sustainable, and they also enable self-determination. So these types of community-driven initiatives, however, are rarely evaluated, and they're often not communicated with government and public health decision makers in any way. So our projects try to use evaluation to build research evidence from these community-led initiatives. And this is really a community-based approach where we can investigate and evaluate what works, for whom, and under what conditions. And we also use this research to provide communities with the evidence of what food is the most healthy and safe for them to eat. So I have another poll here, and I was interested to know whether traditional or country foods are part of any aspect of your work. I feel like maybe we have an sort of a, a engaged key audience here who chose to come to this presentation because um, you do already work in this area, but I'm curious to see how many people do. So we're slowing down. We're about 83% of the group has participated. And we have 55 people saying yes, that traditional or country foods are part of their work. So, you know, a lot of the things I've already said maybe aren't very new to you, but I wanted to set the stage for people who maybe don't work in this system or, or in this environment.
So more than half of our CIHR team grant funding was actually used to hire regional food security coordinators and uh, community research lead over the multi years of the project. And we really saw this as an important piece um, to mobilize uh, food action on the ground. So because these food security coordinators are in their communities, they're able to actually um, implement uh, initiatives. Some of these people were volunteers for a long time and hadn't even been paid for the food work that they'd been doing. And now they're able to get paid. Um, and they're also heavily involved on the research side of things. So our aim is really to build capacity within the food system to make it more self-sustaining. So this includes thinking about informal systems that are non-monetary, for example, where food champions and human resources are key pieces of this system. And I would say that the COVID pandemic really taught us to shift more of this research to the community research leads. You know, we weren't able to travel for several years um, and that is enabling us to build capacity and further enable the research to be self-determined and more empowering. And so this, you know, a lot of my chair research is really focusing on two of the four regions um, in, in the Northwest Territories, the Inuvialuit Settlement Region and the Sawtoo Region. So those are the two that I'm going to focus on today. So within the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, we have several co-located projects, and this really enables us to bring uh, activities across and within each other. Um, and it really builds more success in addressing food security and to answer the questions and requests that were being asked of by the community. So in addition to this CIHR um, grant, we also have a Country Foods for Good Health grant and a um, Country Foods and Community Programs grant funded by CANNOR. Um, and so we're really able to think about some of these broader concepts that we're trying to address. So thinking about um, in the ISR, Inuvial would be benefits from the research activities, this capacity building, making sure that we uh, address the Inuvial with values and knowledge and messaging, bridge elders and youth. Um, a lot of that is with on the land camps, which I'll speak about, as well as knowledge mobilization. Through our co-located projects, we have multiple partners, decision makers, and knowledge users at a variety of levels. And we've built these partnerships over um, a long period of time. They're between ac academics and universities, and they're at the regional level, such as our, our um, partnership with the new Vialuit Regional Corporation, as well as organizations like the Sawtoo Renewable Resources Board. Um, we are also, uh, very connected with the community corporations and the communities that we work with and the hunter and trappers committees, along with um, education councils and territorial governments. So I have a relationship with um, people working in the Department of Health and Social Services of the government of the Northwest Territories. We also have additional funders for our project, so we're able to do quite a lot. And the case studies that we're working on are really collaborative. Um, they're based on evaluating these current community-led food system and climate initiatives, but the exact sort of methodology and methods that we're using are really being determined with our community partners, decision makers, and knowledge user input. So some of that may take the form of storytelling, talking circles, um, terminology workshops, or on the land gatherings, which are a little bit out of scope for some of the typical research um, that maybe you've heard about, or maybe that's happening in other areas of Canada. So I'm going to first talk more broadly about what our projects look like, and then I'm going to go into more detail for three of the case studies that I wanted to share today. So one of the ways that we're identifying place-based priorities and how we support, support community initiatives is through on the land camps. And this picture is from a camp in, in August 2019, before the pandemic. Um, these camps involve shared on the land experiences with researchers and community members, and they create a space for shared learning and a dialogue to identify community needs and priorities and for facilitating health and well-being. They're also a space where land-based skills can be transferred between elders, community members, and youth, and opportunities for that cross-cultural learning with researchers. And for example, we had some activities where, um, you know, researchers were uh, taken fishing, known how to prepare the fish. Um, and then we also had some researchers who were doing water sampling, for example. Um, we had environment and, and natural resources from the government of Northwest Territories come to the camp um, and explain some of their community monitoring um, 
aspects and so that community members could really see how that was integrated into the spaces that they live. Um, another example is using sort of alternative types of facilities to process food. So this is a food processing tailor, trailer sorry, in the Northwest Territories. Um, it can provide a specialized space to process food in traditional ways, such as smoking or drying, um, as well as to preserve local through, foods through canning. And it's also an opportunity to explore the policies around how food processed in the trailer can be shared and used in different settings within the communities. And so this work also sort of looks at, okay, if we're processing food in this facility, how can that food be shared with others, both within the community and outside of the community? And depending on uh, where you are in the North, uh, traditional or country food cannot be sold. Nunavut is different, but the Northwest Territories um, is not the same. Um, and in terms of food policies, the Northwest Territories actually has had um, uh, the meat, no meat regulations for a long time, so since about 2009, and they've just recently been working on um, new meat regulations, um, but this is not for traditional or country food. These are meat regulations based around um, agricultural type food activities. So we've also been working closely with um, with the government. So for example, we've worked closely with Alan Torn at the Department of, of Health and Social Services to really, really try and tease out um, what the what the implications are for public health um, in terms of wild game or country food harvesting and whether that wild game would be able to be sold. This is not, you know, a, a topic without some some tension. You know, there are specific foods that um, uh, community members have told us they don't feel uh, comfortable in terms of having for commercial sale. For example, caribou is being sacred, but there's other animals that they feel more comfortable with that. So it's it's something that that we're exploring together. Some of the communities we work with also want to grow food. So with climate change and warming in the north, there's more opportunity for agriculture. Um, we did do a um, an evaluation of the, the Yellowknife farmers market several years ago. And there's really potential for food sharing distribution systems within northern regions. So food could be distributed regionally through a hub like Yellowknife. And these kind of established structures like the Yellowknife farmer, farmers market could be a part of this hub. So I'm just going to share examples, uh, a little bit more detail of three food system case studies in the Northwest Territories. The first one I'm going to talk about is country foods and community programming in the, the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, or the ISR. And that project is funded by uh, CANOR. Um, the second one is the trailer processing facility in the Sawtu Region. And the third one is investigating uh, lead exposure in Northern Canada and the Sawtu Region. So this first case study is um, around country foods and community programming. So the goal of this was to better incorporate country foods into schools, daycares, cooking circles, and youth centers through collaboration with existing programs. So we really wanted to determine what the pathways are to increase country food use and community programs, and how can we make that um, those pathways more resilient and sustainable for communities to implement. So some of the, the activities that we were doing was we were looking at what is the existing infrastructure in the communities and the capacity to support country food inclusion, um, what kind of food processing, processing, sorry, processing and storage spaces are available in each community, um, because it really varies. What are the existing harvest programs that provide country foods? How could those programs be enhanced? And how can those programs be connected to um, programming like uh, schools and, and being able to offer some of those country foods in schools? We're also looking at guidelines to support the inclusion of country foods and programs and opportunities to share knowledge and expand this to other communities. So I'm going to read an excerpt written by our community research lead, um, Selena Wolke, uh, who lives in Politech. So she said, and this was this was after we'd had an opportunity to try and bring more country food into the school and working with the youth. She said, with the community caribou harvest, we held a cooking program with the youth at the high school where they prepared a caribou soup. They all went through the process of preparing the caribou meat that was donated, also adding the additional ingredients for the soup. The youth asked, um, were able to ask questions about everything that we were doing. The youth in my community are very appreciative and thankful that they are included in the surveys and the programs that were held. They had mentioned thanks for hearing us 
and seeing us as a valued part of the community as it's part of their future. Another aspect of this country foods and community programming uh, project is to look at um, what are the country food pre preferences for students. So we've developed this uh, survey tool um, in the schools where we ask students to share their preferences for which country foods they wanna eat, what food activities they wanna participate in, who in the community they wanna learn from and what, what food and harvesting skills they want to learn. So we tried to make this survey really accessible with mostly graphics and the drawings were done by Shania Noxana, who's an Inuvialuk um, from Tuktoyaktuk. And uh, this survey is just being launched in February. So we are, we are looking forward to getting some um, uh, important results. And this was really uh, of interest to, um, to the school, to the uh, leadership in the communities, as well as to more regional levels uh, you know, government of Northwest Territories. So this is really, there's not a whole lot of data from um, youth and children around um, country foods. So this is uh, um, something that I think will really add to that. We also aim to bridge uh, community realities, re realities and knowledge through bridging community input into these territorial and regional policies, while at the same time connecting and aligning community scale capacity building and food safety training with these existing policies. So for example, right now there are existing guidelines for tr traditional foods, um, serving them in social service facilities like hospitals in the Northwest Territories, but there aren't sort of equivalent guidelines for serving um, traditional foods in schools, daycares, or cooking circles in the Northwest Territories. So we're trying to work towards building some policies around that, um, sort of stemming from the ones that are already developed um, but in a way that the schools will be able to uh, incorporate country foods into their programming. So the second case study is this trailer uh, food processing facility. And uh, the goal of this one was to evaluate a country food processing training course that was taught in this facility in Delaney um, and to understand how it could be used as a tool to increase food access. Um, and this was actually a, a project that my master's student worked on. Um, and so there was, uh, there was people from the community who were being trained uh, in the trailer to use the, the trailer facility. Um, and we did a pre-post survey with the trainees um, as well as semi-structured interviews. And we also had an open house um, with uh, community members invited to eat and participate in the food that had been processed in the trailer. Um, and they actually had a great turnout. It's not that big of a community. So 70 people turned out for this open house. Um, and we also did sur some surveys with the people who were interested. So we had seven, 17 surveys from the people at the open house. And this is really an example um, of that climate adaptation piece because a lot of the food that was processed in the facility were things that um, people maybe hadn't been use, using uh, very much in their community. So, um, for example, muskox is now more prevalent in some communities where it wasn't before. Um, but if it hasn't been used uh, uh, traditionally, so if people haven't in the past harvested muskox and really known um, what to do with it, this was an opportunity to do some training around that. And from the survey, we did also learn that uh, uh, community members are really open to trying new foods like muskox burgers and muskox sausage and other ways of, of sort of processing foods that they already uh, were accustomed to like candied lake trout. So the third case study I want to share is investigating lead exposure in Northern Canada. And through this project, we did a literature review to look at lead levels and sources of exposure. Um, we looked at water samples. We also looked at lead levels in hunter shot birds. And we worked with community members to develop a survey to identify risk factors for exposure to lead. Um, the initial project didn't have funding to implement the survey, but we now have funding to do that. So we're gonna be able to move forward. Um, so I'm gonna sort of flow this into the knowledge mobilization piece at the end of the presentation that I want to speak to. Um, so from this lead study, we were able to develop a number of sort of knowledge mobilization products and communication products. Um, the big one was this one pager, you know, just trying to, to be able to convey um, the results of this project in a single page um, that was simple and easy for, for community members um, to, 
to for us to share with them and for them to be able to ask questions. We also created a three pager community presentations and meetings um, with an aim to co develop messages. Um, and because it was funded by the Northern Contaminants Program, we had to do a synopsis report and on the academic side also had a manuscript submitted. So on the side of um, knowledge mobilization, uh, specific to health and risk communication, you know, we first work with our community partners to share our research findings back to the communities. That is the, the most important thing we do at the very beginning. Um, and then as long as our agreements with our community partners allow for it, we then also are able to create other knowledge products like the ones that I've shared here. Um, and uh, we can really learn what the research needs are at both the community level and the government level by sharing these at various scales. We can co-develop communication tools and also share findings um, to both groups and if they're willing, share findings to other groups. We also learned that it's important to do things like terminology workshops. Um, this is an example where the word contaminant couldn't be directly translated into slavey. Um, so for some of the communities uh, earlier in the projects, we did terminology workshops to determine what kind of phrase or word they might use for contaminant since they didn't have one in their language. We also have um, produced other types of knowledge products like newsletters, magazines, and cookbooks. And these were, you know, cookbooks were actually requested by the communities. And once we did it in one community, um, most of the other communities have asked us to do that or to facilitate it um, in their own communities. Um, we have also developed infographics. This one in the center is from that uh, food processing trailer case study. And we do have community research leads um, as I mentioned, that are really critical to the success of our projects. Um, what I'm really proud of is that we are actually able to bring our community research leads and community partners to the ArcticNet conference in Toronto in, this past December. And it, it enabled us to co-present together and for them to network with other in, Inuit and Inuvialuit that had come to the conference. And then they could share their perspectives in a national forum. Um, so this is the third and last poll. Um, so what type of knowledge mobilization do you think has the most impact in your work? And there's a lot of response options here, so you may have to scroll down. I think we've suggested that you only answer, have one, a single choice answer, so you can't answer multiple ways, but I'm curious to see um, how you might respond to this. Also in developing this list, I mean, I left, I left a few things off, um, even though we know that working with communities, uh, social media and things like radio are really important ways to communicate. Um, so I wanted to just get your ideas about the, these ones here. So right now in the lead is workshops training at 28%. Maybe I shouldn't say that before everybody's participated, but. All right, it's slowed down. So we have 71% of people who participated, 30% for 31% now for workshops training. Um, what is the next one? And then there's a couple of uh, presentations to your specific audience at 15%, and then a couple at 13%, such as infographics and engaging, communicating in person and one-on-one. -on -one. And I wonder too if, I mean, I know that now that we're able to engage in person, it is, there's nothing like it um, after not being able to do that for several years. Okay. So just two more slides here um, to finish off this presentation. So I think I think what I wanted to convey is that this work really aligns, um, I think, with the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health um, across you know, all of these areas that I've, I've shown on the slide. And I hope that I've also been able to demonstrate through these case studies um, and our work, some aspects of equity, resiliency, sustainability that we're trying to build into this work as well. So um, I'm, I'm open to, to questions about that um, 
if you've put them in the chat or after I'm done this last slide. So we know from our work um, that indigenous food systems and northern food systems are already innovative. So, you know, we're not bringing any innovation to that. Um, we're just trying to connect some of those pathways. And what I think we can learn from this research is that we can use things like evaluation methodologies, local knowledge, um, and re 